Welcome to Space Vidcast, episode 29 for October 31st, 2008. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me is the beautiful, wonderful, talented, and always incredible. Did I ever say incredible? I don't know. I'll Carrie take it. Ann Higginbotham. She's my wife. We are the Space Vidcasters. We are tan. We're normally not tan. We're from Minnesota. We are well, tan. Because not that they can tell, but yeah, we are tan, I swear. <laughs> we are. Uh, we just got back from New Mexico covering the... Uh, X Prize Foundation's Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge. Yes. And uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. We'll be talking about that in the back half of the show. We'll be For showing sure. you kind of what happened there, give you some quick little snippets and fun things like that. <laughs> and hopefully you got to see us do stream that live because it really truly was a uh, an awesome, awesome event. It was craziness. It crazy. was really cool. I apparently had no idea how crazy it was actually going to be. I figured there was, when I was thinking, okay, there's going to be a lot of downtime. Right. I was thinking like downtime. No. <laughs> no. Downtime was scramble around. Make sure you have somebody. Let's talk to this person. Who is it? I don't know. We'll talk to them anyway. <laughs> no. That's what our downtime was. It was ridiculous. So let's start our Halloween episode of Space Vidcast with some space news. Space news! <laughs> <sighs> oh, man. Yeah, there we go. Let's start us off with this one here. All right. So... Messenger has flown by Mercury and has given us some gorgeous, gorgeous pictures. Yeah, look at that. That's cool. That is a regular picture of Mercury along with the enhanced picture of Mercury. Those aren't the actual colors per se, but it's uh, minerals and they're not exactly sure what all of that stuff is. But these pictures are beautiful. They're like freaking Hubble pictures as far as look, I'm concerned. arrows in a square. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. They were pointing out different things and this kind of thing. Um, and anyway, but this is about, th it's about the land area of South America, and it's about another 30% of the planet. So now we've seen a total of 90% of all of Mercury, which is really cool. Um, Messenger, by the way, in case anybody's asking or didn't know, stands for Mercury Surface Space Environment Geochemistry and Ranging Messenger. So there you go. I think they came up with Messenger, and they're like, all right, now we need it to mean yeah, something. Yeah, no, I, that's exactly <laughs> what they did, So, and that's fine. Uh, so and with all the flybys and all of this stuff, that's three flybys so far. Yep. There will be uh, – Messenger will go into permanent orbit of Mercury in 2011. Ooh. Uh, yeah, so I thought that that was kind of cool because now we, we've seen 90% of the planet, and there's uh, – like. Cat can back me up on this. There's smooth surface. There's craters and stuff like that. And it's really, really interesting. It's quite fascinating, actually. And uh, NASA has a little, like, thing where they go over all of it. Mm -hmm. And, again, boring as all get out, but <laughs> fascinating at the same time. Only NASA can do that. Yeah. The most boring, fascinating topics known to man. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know how they are able to do that, but consistently they are boringly fascinating. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Speaking of boringly fascinating, how about some Hubble? All right. Well, Hubble is back up and running. <clears throat> Pardon me. We're talking about side B here. It has been down for a month. Um, and the thing that I really wanted to talk about for the most part is not that just that Hubble is back up. Because, I mean, that's great. Don't get me wrong. Um, but this is kind of interfering with a bunch of different things. Because it went down, STS-125 had to be uh, postponed for a wee bit. And we weren't sure when it was going to have to go back up because there is the last servicing mission to Hubble yet to go, right. which is STS-125. It looks like STS-125, although we did have the option to take uh, Discovery's time slot, right. is going to be moved to well, like... Not really take Discovery's time slot, but right before Discovery went up. Right. Right, in February. Right, we were mm -hmm. thinking February-ish. Now right. it looks like it's being pushed off to like April-ish, May-ish mm -hmm. kind of thing. And the big deal is that we need to get uh, STS-125 up in the air as soon as humanly possible because we have to tear down everything and make room for Ares. Right. Which means that Aries now, which Const was... Constellation. Yes. Constellation looked like it was kind of going up in like April, May-ish. And now that looks like it's being pushed off to like June, July, I think is what I've been hearing. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a concern for me, which I, I don't know. I mean, I just thought that that was... It's great Hubble's up and running. I'm very happy about that. On side B. Yes, on side B. 
And right. so we're going to go up and fix it, and it's all going to be happy-go-lucky. Right. There was actually a teleconference, a phone conference earlier today, and oh, okay. I'll see if I can't find uh, some way to post that. I did record it. Um, but there was a phone conference about the STS-125 mission where they said, absolutely, we're going to we're going to delay. And I got the impression in that phone conversation that they're delaying a lot further. I, I think they're delaying. I thought I had heard somewhere in there that they are delaying past 2009 completely. Really? Yeah. I was only like half listening because oh, I was working man, too. Guys. But there was a lot of <laughs> stuff. I mean, that was an action packed. I mean, they had just a ton of information in there. Okay. And they were talking about how they, what, you know, they have the side A, side B, and all that other fun jazz and what they need to do and how they have like these spare parts on the ground, but they can't use them completely because they're not quite ready for flight. And okay. it's all a giant mess. So Yeah, Kessa's kind of backing us up on that where nobody really knows for sure, for sure, exactly what's right. going on. But. Yep. That's uh, the gist of it. Well, if that's you will. spooky. That's it. <laughs> hmm, not really sure how that goes. Uh, so you know, I'm not sure that uh, here. What do you think, Head? <laughs> I don't think it's gonna happen. <laughs> All right. It's good to know. <laughs> Leave my girl alone. <laughs> it's gonna be a fun show today. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So, all right, so, uh, you know, Constellation delayed some more. Originally, Constellation internally was supposed to be go up at, uh, you know, 2013. Uh, the external date has always been, I believe, 2015. That's right. what Congress had said, and <clears throat> NASA's internal date has now slipped to 2015. So the chances of Constellation going up with the Ares rocket, Ares 1, Ares 5, and the Orion crew capsule, I think, are very slim but we're still too early in the program to figure For this out. For sure. And there's a whole lot of other stuff going on behind the scenes. They've now got a plan on the table to keep two shuttles running through 2015. <clears throat> I'm like, ugh. Wow. So much, so much stuff. Yeah. So, so much stuff, so little time. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of that personally. I think we should just shut the shuttles down, start yes. with Constellation. And actually, I think we should shut Constellation down and do something new and innovative. But, you know. Okay. Uh, right, and as Carbon just said, the plan is on the table, but not nowhere near finalized. They right. just basically have a document outlining how it could be done. Mm -hmm. They're not saying they're going to do it, but just the fact that we have a document saying, we, you know, a proposal out there for this is just like, guys, give it up. Just, no. No more shuttle. You've had your 30-some-odd years, 40, um, almost 40 years. We're done. We're moving on. And um, let's move past Constellation into some sort of really cool vehicle, but... Um, you know, I think that, in my opinion, NASA needs to reinvent itself, just like it did. You know, it invented itself with Apollo. It reinvented itself with a space shuttle. And then there's Constellation. But uh, that's the state we're in today. Just my, my well, opinion. anyway. I'll get off my soapbox. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. Your turn. What's next? <laughs> so, I know you guys heard about India. They made a launch. Great. Mm -hmm. Yippee. Well, no, they made a really cool launch because they're sending they're sending a uh, craft around the moon. Yes. That's not an easy thing <clears throat> to do. No, I'm not saying that it is. Yep. However, did you know that Venezuela just sent something up on Wednesday? I did know that. Of course you knew that. I'm a space vidcaster. I know these things. All right, fine. <laughs> Anyhow, Venezuela actually sent something up. Thank you. Oh, hey, mystery team. There you go. Um, courtesy of China. Mm-hmm. Uh, Venezuela also has their own uh, sort of uh, KSC, if you will. They have a mission control in Venezuela yep. that's like a building, building and a half. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they do have it. Um, it's their first satellite, and it's mostly for just uh, TV, radio, internet access coverage right. in really remote areas. Venezuela is actually pretty big. Uh, but it's supposed to, coverage will go southern Mexico all the way down to like central Chile, they're saying. Hmm. So it's a pretty big area. Well, what's interesting is that, you know, as we talk about these different areas, it sounds like the space race is kind of back on with India, China, Japan. Uh, Japan's already Funny you mention that because NASA just came to an agreement with Korea, mm -hmm. of all places in the universe, um, for a, they've signed a letter of an intent for future endeavors is essentially what it comes down to. Okay. Um, little helping here, little money there, little we give you this, you give us that, but nothing really super aggressive mm -hmm. per se. But right. now Korea, like I said, again, of all places in the universe, has an agreement mm -hmm. with NASA. You know, I think we're going to talk a little bit about this next week, actually, where we're going to talk about... Um, not just the space race, you know, starting back up again, which right. is a really good thing for space travel because, <laughs> oh, 
awesome. Well, right, because, you know, the last time we had a huge push in space was when we had the space race against Russia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone was working as fast as they could, and we got a lot of stuff done in a very short time period. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why I'm a huge fan of the XPRIZE Foundation, because when you have a contest, when you're racing to hit, reach the finish line, you, you're incentivized to do more things. Right. And, you know, that's why SpaceX is good. That's why another space race between all these governments is good. Um, but in addition, you know, I think there's a topic here that can be, there's a point to be said about, you know, there was the industrial revolution, then there was the technology revolution, and now there may be the space revolution, which may, could potentially, potentially, I need to form my thoughts on this a little bit better, which is why we're not going to talk about it too much this week, but could potentially get us out of the global recession that we're currently entering, or in at this point. Mm -hmm. It could be what helps save all of our, the world economy, essentially. Uh, awesome. We reinvent the world with space travel. But, um... You know, I think we're going to talk about that a little bit more next week and some of the cool things we can do there. So I'll, I'll just table that for now. Just think about it. That's Chew it. on it for a little bit. I'm done. You're done? That was yeah. the last thing? Ta-da! All right. Well, then when we come back, we're <laughs> going to be talking about XPRIZE Foundation's Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge and a little bit about what happened there and how awesome it was. Awesome. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Space Shuttle Endeavour has completed an unusual journey. No, it wasn't its upcoming mission into space. In fact, the winged spacecraft hasn't even left the ground at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. In preparation for launch on its STS-126 mission, Endeavour moved from the spaceport's launch pad 39B to nearby pad 39A. This is only the third time in more than 25 years that a shuttle has been moved from one pad to the other. The shuttle began the eight-hour roll-around at 8.28 a.m. Eastern Time and was in place on Pad A at 4.37 p.m. Endeavour and its mobile launcher platform were carried by the giant crawler transporter, which crept along at less than a mile an hour. But instead of taking a direct route to its destination, the shuttle had to take a bit of a detour. The crawler transporter can only travel on a special road called the crawlerway which is designed to handle the shuttle's enormous weight. There is no crawler way linking the two paths, so Endeavour rolled back to the point where the roads to the launch pads meet. The shuttle then proceeded toward launch pad 39A. Now that Endeavour is in place, technicians have installed the payload and will continue preparing the shuttle for its STS-126 mission to the International Space Station. What comes to mind when you think of Halloween? Trick-or-treating? Jack-o'-lanterns? Ghouls and goblins? But the sun? Probably not. But just five years ago in the week surrounding Halloween, the sun sent us some tricks and treats of its own. The tricks were a series of some of the most powerful solar storms ever measured. Storms that disrupted power grids, communication lines, and satellites. But the treats were some extraordinary auroras seen as far south as Florida and Texas. The effects of these storms on the Earth were ghoulish enough that we had to reroute aircraft. It affected satellite systems and communications. It actually caused a power outage in Sweden for about an hour. But I think generally the, the public was very excited to see the ghostly aurora that were created in the night sky. The aurora are normally limited to higher latitudes, and so these storms were so powerful that they created aurora that could be seen as far south as Florida. 
So you can imagine seeing these ghostly figures haunting the night sky. In all, nearly 17 major flares erupted on the sun during those two weeks in 2003. The result of energy building up in the sun's magnetic field lines until they became strained enough to suddenly snap like an overstretched rubber band. The results were coronal mass ejections, the largest explosions in the solar system, able to launch up to 10 billion tons of electrified gas into space and cause some of the ghoulish effects we felt here on Earth. These storms were also eerie because they came at such a surprising time. These storms were spooky because of the timing of which they occurred. That is to say that it didn't occur in a stage where most of the activity occurs. In fact, it occurred about three and a half years after solar maximum occurred, so it was spooky in that respect. And it was also spooky in the intensity of the storms. These were some of the largest storms ever observed. So can we expect to see any ghostly looking auroras in the night sky this Halloween? Well, I don't think we're going to see a uh, repeat this Halloween on the five-year anniversary because we're at a, at a time where there are very little active regions on the sun. However, we are going to be ascending to a greater um, period of solar activity. So, you know, we may see some large storms in the next few years. Still think the sun isn't so scary? Hopefully this spooky tale will make you think again. This week's TLA is actually a FLA, yes. I guess. <laughs> a four-letter acronym. Four letter Sorry. Letter. So who can tell us what WSMR is? It's our TLA for the week. And th this is actually uh, one of those areas uh, it's pretty close to us because we, well, we'll tell you as soon as someone can figure it out in the chat room. We're still waiting for <laughs> anyone in the chat room to tell us what WSMR, no Googling, no Googling. And I know that cat is Googling right now. Uh, is AM to radio talk. <laughs> uh, Killer K's got it. it. Is the White Sands missile range? Missile range or missile range? Very nice. Absolutely. And that uh, picture that you're seeing right there is actually the trail of a. I don't know which missile, but it's a trail which I just thought was really cool. Um, I think that is it a missile or is it the space shuttle? Oh, it might be a shuttle. Uh, well, actually, uh, no. If it launched from I, that wouldn't make WSMR, sense. then yeah, it's not. Yeah. A, uh, <laughs> it's not it's not the space shuttle. No. All right, so we just got back from the Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge, which was a blast and a half. And for those of you who missed it, for the first year ever, we actually had a winner. There are two levels for the Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge. There's a the easy level and the hard level for They're both hard. All right, the hard level and the harder level. There you go. Does that make... Does that, yes, that's yeah. much better. <laughs> they notice the heads of multiple. Oh, you missed... Yeah, here are my that. girls. Yeah, just move that right, that right over there. Maybe a little creepier. Yeah. yeah just like that. Yeah, maybe I'll just kind of have it floating. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> there you go. The the easy level was won this year by Armadillo Aerospace. Who's yes. Who's been, been competing for three years now. Yes, this is their third year. Third year in competing, and they won level one, which is the hard, not the harder, but the hard level. Right. Exactly. Right. I think it's well, easier. For okay. To first of all, you got a what is it? A ten meter pad. Yep. That you have to start on. Mm -hmm. You have to go fifty meters in the air. Mm -hmm. You have to go over. Translate. You have Trans to go over. Translate. I love that. A hundred meters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to uh, hover on that pad. You did. Yeah. Okay. That, you yeah. have to hover for ninety seconds, and you have to land precisely on another ten meter pad. Yep. This is not easy. Then you have to shut everything down, refuel, restart everything, and go all the way back up 50 meters, over 100 meters, down 50 meters again. That's all, all within a two and a half hour time frame. Right. And what people, I think that's what people didn't quite understand. And I didn't actually get it until I was there. We were what, a quarter of a mile away from the three pads? Three quarters of a mile. Okay. So we were three fourths of a mile away from the pads. That's where your two and a half hours starts. So you have to start. It, there essentially was a starting line. You start there. You drive the th three quarters of a mile to the pads. You unload your vehicle. You gas up your vehicle and all that other crap that you need to do. Start it up, up, over, down, refuel, up, over, down again. And then you have to reload everything back onto your truck and drive all the way back to the finish line again, which again is almost a mile away. Mm -hmm. 
That's what you have to do in two and a half hours. It's very difficult. You know, just the idea that you have to launch your rocket twice within two and a half hours, that alone is very difficult. Right. But then on top of that, you have to, it has to be safe. It has to be in a decent working condition when it crosses. Yeah. So it's not like you can launch, land, and just cripple the vehicle. That's, that's not right. acceptable. Right. If you crash, that's not, that doesn't work. If you land on the pad, but like one foot is off and you kind of topple off the pad, that doesn't work. There are a lot of different restrictions to it that make it a lot harder than it sounds. So let's take a look at the first two, first two flights. This is Armadillo Aerospace. This is the first of the two flights that won them the level one prize. There you go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have ignition. We have liftoff. Start looking at your watches. At tw We're 15 seconds into flight. Thirty seconds into flight. Fifty meters altitude. Rock solid. 60 seconds into flight. John is holding at a higher altitude right now. 70 seconds into flight. Eighty seconds. He's holding above eighty five seconds. 90 seconds. All right, unofficially first leg complete. And that actually was official. That did that was the first leg and they did complete that one and it worked it worked great. And then there was a little bit of a weird thing because they had to shut down the airport because they were actually at an active airport. Right. So they normally would have had to complete that in two and a half hours, but they paused the clock right then and there. Well, and this was a little bit controversial. And I know some of you guys who were with us at the time, there was a lot of confusion as to what was going on. The FAA had to open the space up. Mm -hmm. they, so we weren't allowed to do the rocket thing during this time. I mean, unfortunately, it happened to cut right in the middle of the two and a half hours that Armadillo had for this particular level. So that was a little, ev exactly, everyone was freaking out. Nobody yep. really knew what to do. Nobody really knew exactly what was going on. This is something that clearly had not come up before. Eventually, it had been determined by the official judges that that leg would be allowed to count mm -hmm. and that when they tried again, all they needed to do was the second leg. Right. And here is the second leg. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We have liftoff. We have liftoff and the clock has started. Ten seconds in. Twenty seconds. Thirty seconds. Halfway there, 45 seconds. Over the pad, hovering at one minute.
15 seconds left. Raising dust. Three, two, one, 90 seconds. Nominal shutdown on the pad. Base Ops, this is SO. The vehicle has landed, beginning <laughs> depress and detank. That's not good to hear. Space Boss, this is your Space Ops and Executive Channel. Armadillo reports that vehicle has landed and they are beginning depressurization and detank. This is Space Boss, I copy. So we're just waiting for an official uh, official call on time. Total time in flight, I got 135, Jeff got 134. All right, we got 90 seconds plus, folks. As long as the vehicle gets back here in the next 30 minutes, we're going to have a winner. And they got back in the next 30 minutes. That they did. And we had a winner. We did. So the first place level one prize is now accounted for, but there's still a level one second place prize that they're going to go for next year. And there's level two. Yes. Level two is a little bit more difficult. You have to actually land on a simulated lunar surface and you have to stay airborne for 180 seconds. Now they, Armadillo Aerospace also attempted to fly their quad module, or also known as Pixel, and that just didn't. They were just having issues, and they're like, nope. Now, we have video of that, but really just kind of just a giant poof of smoke. So there's really yeah, nothing not to show. Yeah, it's not nearly as interesting as so it So we're not even going to show that. Seemed like. No. So next year, we'll still have the Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge, and there's mm -hmm. talk that maybe they'll do it even a little bit sooner than that. You know, probably no sooner than 2009, but definitely stay... Stay tuned to space.xprize.org and check out the Lunar Lander Challenge section inside of that website. Mm -hmm. And they'll, you know, they'll give you the updated status to what's going on with the Lunar Lander Challenge, level one and level two. Uh, second prize now for level one being made available and first prize and second prize for level two. So that's exciting stuff. Let me just say really quickly that the, that the second prize, you still have to do the exact same thing. Second prize is really just the second person to do exactly the same thing. Right, and the advantage of, of doing mm. it this way is that you don't want to just have one company that can do all this stuff. You right. want to have competition. You want to have a couple different companies that can do this. And there were nine teams that entered into the Northrop Grumman, Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge, but only two were actually able to compete right there um, during the event itself. Which and is that, a big deal. And for those of you who weren't with us before and who weren't following along, uh, like we said, Armadillo Aerospace, who won the first level uh, this particular time around, was one of the teams that flew. The other team that flew was called True Zero. They're out of Illinois, and they are four guys, four guys, not a lot of guys, mm -hmm. just four guys that pretty much tinker around, do some stuff, they did a meat slicer, they did an electric go-kart, they did an electric car, and then somebody said, Let's build a rocket. Yeah, what do you think about rockets? Rockets are fun. You think we can do that? That's dangerous, right? Right. Yeah. That's what they did. In ten months. Yes, that's the other thing, is that ten months prior to this competition, they said, yeah, okay, rockets, mm -hmm. sure, we could probably figure that out, I guess. Had an idea, wrote it down, submitted it, built it, and got permission to fly it, brought it down there, and flew their vehicle. It's incredible. Armadillo Aerospace is headed up by, and pretty much financially backed for the most part, by John Carmack. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know who John Carmack is, he was the lead programmer on Quake and Doom. A couple of video games you may or may maybe, not have maybe, heard of. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. So they've got money. They've got a huge team. They've got two different vehicles. They've got this huge crane to move all the stuff around. And then there's True Zero, who rented a, like a budget rent a car. Like a Penke or Penske or whatever yeah, that is. That's I mean, hilarious. They, they've just got this, you know, rented truck mm -hmm. that they drove down. And even when they went from the start line to the pad, it was like them in their pickup. Right. You yep. know? It was it's hilarious. Four guys and a pickup. And then they, they just lift it out and set it on the pad. Yes. And yep. it, it was just, it was the David and Goliath is really what it came down to. Right. And so they were the underdog that, uh, you know, not that 
I mean, not that we're belittling Armadillo. Or no, but, not mean, at clearly all. Clearly, that was awesome, not and we just all. wanted someone to win, and we're glad that Armadillo did win. For sure. Uh, but True Zero was the underdog, and there were a couple of neat things that True Zero had going against them. Mm -hmm. For example, they did not ever chest their vehicle untethered. There was always a tether. They were increasing the power of the engine itself by also increasing the potency of the fuel. Mm -hmm. They tweaked some of the way the engine works a little bit. They'd never translated before. There were a bunch of firsts on this particular uh, flight. And uh, this is how it ended up. Three, two, two one. one. We have liftoff. We're about 10 seconds in. Translation, and we have failure of the... Safety, safety, safety. Declaring a level three emergency. Level three emergency has been declared. Vehicle has fallen out of the sky. You can see the hydrogen peroxide vent. The vehicle has crashed. A level three emergency is where they request the support of the fire department and vehicles to approach the vehicle, make sure that uh, it is put out. A very successful liftoff. Echo to PM, have the fire department respond and stand by at the PM shelter. So a little bit of a bummer. Uh, but also to be expected, right? I mean, the first time you untether your crap, th this is right. this literally is rocket science, right? right. So. Which was the big joke for the weekend. It's like, well, it's not like it's brain surgery, <laughs> because what else are you gonna say? Right. So uh, you know, we were rooting for True Zero, and we certainly hope. And I know I, I'm gonna speak for everyone because I can. <laughs> uh, we all hope that True Zero competes again next year because we're excited to see what they're able to do. And we were talking with them before they ever flew, and one of the things they said is, you know even if we crash it, it, as long as we get off the ground that that's half of it right there we just need to figure out what we need to tweak to, to fix it yeah uh, they actually crashed their own vehicle they aborted they manually aborted the vehicle they noticed that it started to spin out of control and rather than get into a situation that maybe wasn't safe they it was Todd I believe that hit the abort switch right well the other thing to note though like we were talking about before with these 10 meter pads that are about a hundred meters from each other Outside of that, so from ground zero, if you will, 200 meters are where the pet, or 100 meters out, but so a 200 yep. meter uh, diameter, mm -hmm. right? And then another 70 meters outside of that is considered to be the safety zone. There are no, no one is allowed within the safety zone, like closer to the pads, when the vehicle is, you know, lit essentially mm -hmm. and is about to go off. And that includes cameras, everything. When this aborted, because it did go up and it kind of started to spin a little bit and then it kind of tilted and they aborted, which was good, it actually kind of flew out and crashed and it headed almost right for our camera. <laughs> now, we don't have that footage, but I'm sure somebody does. And it's a little creepy because... I, who knows what this poor guy was thinking because, you know, he's looking through everything through the camera and then go... Oh crap, that thing's coming right for me. And you think you're safe. Right. Because you're a good, you know, 170 some odd meters away. Mm -hmm. And yet you're not. And uh, so that's, you know, that's, uh, everyone kind of kept saying, you know, I wish the cameras were closer and you guys should be right there and it's really too bad. Uh uh. Yeah, you uh -uh. don't. Want I would rather be the three quarters of a mile away where <laughs> I was because I was safe. I, I didn't. I wanted to be right next to it. But, you know, hydrogen peroxide is a bad thing for you to... I mean, you'll be bleach blonde by the time you're done dealing with it. Yes, easily. <laughs> oh, goodness. But, no, it, it really is. It's uh, in the potency that they're working with. Apparently, it's very, very deadly. It's very, very bad for you. Um, and, you know, you have to... There are safety precautions you have to take. And that's why we were so far away. That's why the cameras were so far away. I mean, it was it was just a, you know, potentially bad scenario, but everyone was safe and they did a great job of making sure everyone was safe. X Prize Foundation made sure that no one in, you know, there was the 
tiers of zones. Right. And we were all the way outside of the last zone. My mom just asked how close it got to us because, you know, she wants to scold me if it got really close. In all actuality, it flew away from us. <clears throat> so mm-hmm. it actually flew further away from us, but it was flying towards uh, other areas, other, other cameras. people that were inside of that zone. Um, so away from us, but other, towards other cameras and things. So... That's a little bit of what happened. And the fire trucks were really cool because they have to go through the desert, so they look more like tanks. Uh, they really are cool. They're really cool fire trucks. Uh, CEO, this was uh, True Zero. Thank you. Uh, Snibble just answered that in the chat room. Oddfluence, uh, you're asking how big these things are. I assume you're talking about the vehicles themselves. I know True Zero's vehicle was about, what, seven feet? I was going to say seven, eight feet, somewhere in right there. Right in there. So really not that big Mm -mm. when you think about it and uh i would say that mod was probably a little bit taller than that Yeah, a little bit like eight nine feet Mm. kind of thing yeah pixel was short and stout right and so pixel was probably a good six to seven feet across i would think now if you want more information on the northrop grummer grumman lunar lander challenge so much better i'm getting getting better every you know you'd think i'd have that down by now it's just a lot of words Uh, just string together all at once uh we are posting interviews that we conducted throughout the entire two days there. Mm-hmm. We're, we're posting those interviews at www.spacevidcast.com. We've already got the 30, no, I'm sorry, almost hour-long John Carmack interview, which is, he is a hardcore geek. He loves this stuff. I basically, I had to say, and then what? And then he'd go on for 20 minutes. I'd right, go, and I apologize, and then I'd, you then guys. I'd go, then i go, and then what? He'd I'd go on for 20 more I minutes. I totally meant to take questions for you guys, and I just... The man didn't even breathe. It was awesome. He is clearly passionate it was about great. what he does. I mean, I loved it, everything he was saying, but I, there just was no way to kind of sneak in and do something and poke at him or anything. He just went on and on and on. It was great. It was really it is amazing. It an incredible interview. I definitely suggest you guys check it out. Spacevidcast.com. We're also posting, we've had interviews with NASA executives. We've had interviews with the different teams, and we've had interviews with the some Google Lunar X Prize teams which was very cool right so there are two levels of the north grumman lunar lander challenge and the joke was so level one level two nglc and then level five is the Google getting lunar. to the moon exactly so we will be covering the Northrop grumman i'm sorry we'll be covering the google lunar x prize in future shows because that's just yet another one of those things that will frankly change the world oh, the ansari so x cool. prize started it the Northrop grumman lunar lander challenge continues it and the some of the other uh uh, interviews that we had are we had the ma- governor of yep. New, New Mexico. Mexico. I can't talk suddenly. We also had one of the guys that is heading up the Rocket Racing League. Yep. Was another one. Spaceport America. Yeah, Spaceport America. We Thank you, Bill Richardson. Uh, we had, uh, who else did we have? We had a bunch of X Prize people as well. So yep. it, it's. Keep out looking for a lot of those things. If you didn't see them the first time, please come and see them for at least the first time. And if you already saw them the first time, see them the second time because there's probably something that you missed. And they're higher quality. Yes. So uh, this was, I think, a great episode of Space Vidcast. You join us live every Friday morning at 2 o'clock a.m. Coordinated Universal Time. We've added a brand new clock into the top part of the screen when we're not on air doing the show that tells you what the Coordinated Universal Time is and a countdown at the bottom of the screen that lets you know when the live show is going to occur next. So there can be no more questions as to when the next live show is. (laughs) You always know when the next live show is. But just in case you still need that, it's 7 o'clock p.m. on Thursdays, Pacific Daylight Time, 8 Mountain Time, 9 Central Time, or 10 Eastern Time. That's the Thursday prior because time zone crosses Obviously, over. right. So I hope we'll see you guys there <laughs> joining us live, as they're saying in the chat room. Absolutely, join us live. Be a part of the show. Experience the whole thing. Ask your questions. We love to interact with you guys. It's a whole lot of fun. So if you're watching this on YouTube or downloading it, for shame! Well, unless you already watched it live and you're just reviewing it, then good for you. That's cool. Hey. Good for you. (laughs) Nice to see you again. Hey, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you for watching.